Um, so I mentioned that we have, uh, you can actually monitor multiple ham radio bands simultaneously uh, with a single station. So we at NJIT installed the reverse beacon network receiver. We actually installed two of them at the UACNJ observatory in, uh, at the Jenny Jump State Park in Hope, New Jersey. Has anyone here been there? Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful place and every Saturday evening they have public lectures. Um, so I've actually given this talk up there as well. And, um, and then after the public lecture, they have a public telescope night where you can go out in this field and each of these little huts has a telescope in it and you can look at the stars and um, there are other people out there with telescopes. So all of those huts have telescopes for looking at the stars or, or the sun, except for this one over here. So that telescope hut actually belongs to NJIT and we have a LIDAR system in there um, which uses a green laser to measure atmospheric densities and now we also have a reverse beacon network receiver in that hut also. So you can, so the receive equipment's in the hut and then the antennas are up here and so if you go home tonight and you say go on 40 or 80 meters and you uh, call CQ, if you see any of the K2MFF uh, dash 2 or dash 3 RBN receivers pick up your signal, you know that you're being heard at in Hope, New Jersey at UACNJ. Now, those, um, those receivers are being powered by rather inexpensive equipment. Um, well, we have, we have an active magnetic loop up there, uh, active receive loop, that's one of our antennas, and we also have um, an active vertical, uh, both by VX Engineering. Uh, those are the antennas, and they're broadband, so they go from a uh, little above zero to 30 megahertz. And then this is our receiver rack, and it has a CODAR experiment up here that belongs to my friend Ethan KHU. And then my um, RBN receivers are down here. We've got two computers here, so one for each receiver. And then the actual radio is this little thing right here. It's a red pitaya. Okay, this thing costs about three hundred dollars, and you can even get less expensive versions of it as well. And um, it's a network appliance. It's designed to be. Uh, a general purpose FPGA development board. It has um, two 125 mega sample per second um, inputs on it, and so this can actually act as a software defined radio. Uh, Pavel Demin wrote uh, an open source FPGA code that will let this thing listen up to 692 kilohertz segments um, between. Um, the lowest frequency, which is just above zero, up to uh, 62 megahertz on here. So that means I can listen to six almost entirely full HF ham radio bands with this one device simultaneously. Hmm. Okay, so that's pretty nice. So we've got a couple of those up there, and they're acting as our RBN receivers. Um, yeah. What does FPGA stand for? FPGA is a, a field programmable gate array. Okay, and so you can write code that actually changes how the hardware configuration is on that chip. So one of the differences between that chip and say a general purpose CPU is that by configuring um, the hardware, the gates to be in a physical, a particular physical configuration, you can make it very good at doing um, a repeated math operation very quickly. You know, it, you just set the hardware to do this one math operation. And that's basically what software-defined radio is. It's certain math operations that just need to be done fast Fourier transforms over and over and over again, very fast. And so the FPGA is... Um, it enhances the... the it, it gives you the speed that you need to actually do radio like that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Can you just speak about your green laser experiment? Um, sure, so it's a LiDAR system, uh, light detection and ranging, and we can use that um, to go to probe, I think up to tens, so like maybe 30 to 50 kilometers altitude, and it's measuring relative atmospheric densities, and we look for uh, wave structures in the atmosphere. So you'll see the atmosphere moving up and down with time. That's something we call a gravity wave. Not a gravitational wave like you might have heard about in the news, but a gravity wave. And those waves are caused, they can be caused by um, uh, winds blowing across the mountains. So you get mountain waves. Uh, you can get um, other instabilities in the atmosphere that can cause them. 
So that's the main purpose of so, that experiment. So the laser is reflecting off of air particles? Yes, that's right. So you're looking at air density? Mm -hmm. Yeah, neutral, neutral atmospheric particle density. And um, I'm just going the wrong way here. Yeah, and it's really cool to watch that work because the, this part of the hut um, flips open. And then if you're sitting out there at night, um, you're standing out here, and when the laser's on, you just see this single green beam just shoot out from How the... How powerful is the laser? I think it's a 70 watt laser. 70 watts? Like, yeah. It's, <laughs> I, it, so this laser, um, it's the main, it's got two parts to it. Uh, one part is a little bit bigger than like a tower computer, and the other part is the actual laser itself, so it looks like a big version of that. And um, you know, it's powerful enough that it's key operated, so there's a key you have to put in it and turn it on. And, does the FAA have yeah. to yeah. know about this? Yeah, um, I know that our, our, the people who operate that LIDAR have to be aware of those sorts of things. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, so that's what, that's what it does. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty impressive. So if you're ever up there on the night when we're operating that, it's a, it's a fun thing to see. This is a uh, close up. It's hard to see the red patai here. But fortunately, I, even though it's hard to see on the screen there, we have a real setup over here. So after the meeting, you can come up, you can see how one of these reverse speaking network receivers is put together. And it, you can even try calling CQ um, into the dummy load over there. And you can see uh, yourself get spotted by the skimmer server software. So we have a, a live demo here that you can try out and ask questions about. Um, I just want to talk a few more things about uh, space weather and its effect on ham radio. And, and this is more of a personal experience, um, just for fun. And as was mentioned before, I've gotten to go to Antarctica. Uh, I went back in 2014 to help repair what's called a Super Darn radar. Uh, it's a type of ionospheric research radar, the Super Dual Overall Radar Network, and it operates between um, 8 and 20 megahertz. And that's what I use to do my PhD on. But while I was at McMurdo Station, um, they also have a ham radio station there. So I got to hang out there and play with that. And so this is the outside of the ham radio station. And I'm supposed to be going back there this November, if everything goes right. So um, I'll be back. Uh, but one night while I was operating, um, I was operating during an auroral event. And you could really hear how much the aurora influenced our signal. So, um, McMurdo Station is on Ross Island, which is right here in Antarctica. And so here's New Zealand, here's Australia, and so that's where I was. And when the aurora, so the aurora is caused by energetic charged particles um, coming along the Earth's magnetic field lines and entering the upper atmosphere, and they collide with the neutral particles, and they can cause increased ionization and all sorts of other things. And this happens at very fast time scales. So if you have, um, uh, we talked about earlier how variations in electron density can cause radio waves to refract, right? Well, if you change those electron densities very quickly, it changes what height the refractions are taking place at. And if it happens fast enough, it'll actually cause Doppler shifts. And so you'll start hearing all these changes in the pitch of the signal that you're sending. And so I'm going to play a recording for you of when this happened. You'll be able to hear how fast the dynamics of the aurora are um, and how much it can change the signals. So at first, you're going to hear just the side tone of my radio. So it'll be a perfectly pure tone. I'm calling CQ from KC4 USB. And then you'll hear the stations coming back to me. And it's just a mess. It's really hard to like decode anything because you'll hear so much fluctuation. But then after you hear that fluctuation, it's going to clean up because the aurora is going to become more quiescent, quiet, more quiescent, and you'll start hearing the pure tones again. And then that's uh, the end of the recording. I think I'll play this twice, and um, it may take me a minute to get okay, in. We've got the audio. So here we go. Play up one more time. 
one more time. Because I, I think that's really neat to just think that that's, you know, the, the aurora is a major space event, and you can hear it. Sometimes the aurora can get down to here as well, and even farther. It's not often that it does. Hmm. Yeah. Is it so brief in terms of time, the aurora? This is a time interval. Right. right? So, so the so you just have a change and then it just stops. That's within a very short period. Of this time. one was yeah. So the aurora happens on many different time scales. So did you know that the aurora is always present? Yeah. Really? The, yeah, the aurora is always there. There's always some what we call quiescent or quiet arc, okay? But what, when we talk about an auroral event, there's something that happens in space that causes, causes an expansion of the aurora and causes these faster changes. So some, one major event is something called a substorm. And the substorm can last, say, um, say tens of minutes to, to an hour or so, something along those time scales. But within that, Within those timescales, you'll have, as part of the substorm, you'll have these shorter events that may only last like a few minutes. And so that's what you're hearing here, those, those sudden changes. And then, so there's a lot of things that are happening all at once. And here we just captured that very, those fast dynamics. All right? Okay, so I'm going to talk about something called the RBN FOF2. Uh, so we already know what the RBN is. Does anyone know what FOF2 is? Critical frequency. It's a critical frequency of the F2 layer. So um, the F would be the, the lowercase f would be the critical frequency. The O stands for ordinary because when you send a signal up into the ionosphere, it will actually break off into two different um, ray paths. One is called the ordinary path and one is called the extraordinary path. And that's because the extraordinary path is caused because of the Earth's magnetic field. If you didn't have the background magnetic field, you'd only have the ordinary signal. But the um, magnetic field gives you this extra part. And then F2 stands for the F2 layer, which is a particular height of the atmosphere. So um, back to remembering some things from your uh, studying for your license. Uh, this is a little cartoon picture of the ionosphere uh, at night and during the day. And you can see at night, things are pretty simple. Uh, you have no solar inputs, so things just reduce to an E layer. And then you have an F layer. And um, the altitudes are in kilometers here. So the E layer is at about 100 kilometers or 62 miles um, altitude. And then the EF layer is between about 200 to 300 kilometers. And then during the day, you get more ionization. So you have that D layer up here, which is, of course, responsible for so much HF absorption, you still have your E layer, and the F layer breaks off into an F1 and then an F2 layer. Um, now, the FOF2 is a number that we say that they measure that says if you were to send a signal vertically up, mm -hmm. what is the highest frequency that will be refracted back to Earth by the F2 layer? before going out into space. So let's say the, let, for example, let's just say the FOF2 was 10 megahertz. That would mean that below 10 megahertz, if you sent a radio signal straight up below 10 megahertz, that signal could get up to the F2 layer and then be refracted back down. But once you get above um, 10 megahertz, then it would cut out into space, okay? And so this is a parent, and I should also note that even though we call it FOF2 and you only see the F2 layer during the day, you can have, they also measure FOF2 at night as well. Is that the same as the maximum thing. usable frequency? It's related to the maximum usable frequency. Which is exactly? So the difference between FOF2 and the maximum usable frequency is FOF2 is the same as the maximum usable frequency for vertical incidents. 
But as soon as you go obliquely to the ionosphere, you can actually, the ionosphere will allow you to communicate with frequencies higher than the FOF2 as long as you have an angle on it. It's that grazing incidence. Okay? So it's related. So usually the way you measure um, FOF2 is with a device like this, which someone back there mentioned before. You can have an ionosan. And this is essentially a vertical incidence HF radar. And these things can be pretty fancy. Um, we, were, we met uh, Dr. Terry Bullock this um, summer a few weeks ago. And um, he works out in Colorado and uh, manages many of these things. And uh, you know, these are very sophisticated pieces of equipment. They're also um, rather large. So I know that this is a picture of a small ionosan. And by small, this is only 15 meters tall and uh, 45 meters long. So you can um, roughly multiply those numbers by three to get them in feet. So it's like, you know, 45 feet tall and say, you know, nine, 135 feet uh, long. So it's, this is a pretty big thing. And so you can't, you can't have these everywhere because they're expensive to install and to maintain and things like that. Um, they measure a lot of things, and one of the things they measure is FOF2. Um, this is what we call an ionogram, and so here you're sweeping up in frequency, and these are reflections that you get back down, and you can measure, here's the E layer, so um, you can measure FOE is around 3 megahertz, um, FOF1 is around 4 megahertz, and here FOF2 is around 5 megahertz. And, um, and this, this number, um, this is all related to what's called the plasma frequency. So the, plas the FOF2 is the plasma frequency at the uh, peak, the highest density part of the F2 region. And why that's important is you can actually relate the number of electrons, the electron density at that point to the plasma frequency. So if you know this number, then you know um, the electron density at that particular height. And it's a rather, this approximation is a rather simple approximation. So this is one of the reasons the FOF2 number is really valuable. Okay. Is that where the data comes from for the ray tracing model? Um, for electron density? Ray yeah, it's one of the places. So the data that I showed for the ray tracing model before is, came from something called the International Reference Ionosphere, or the IRI. And that is um, an empirical model that has taken in observations from ionosons and incoherent scatter radars and other sources for many different, for a long period of time, and then has made an estimate of what the ionosphere of the Earth should look like. Okay, so that's a numerical model. Yeah, and that model is good. Say it is good for averages. So it's like if you go plot the IRI for today, it should represent pretty well what the ionosphere looks like on average for this particular month. But it you could have on this particular day because of say a geomagnetic storm or something, you have some major departures. Okay. Any other questions on this? Can you read that formula one more time? Sure. And it says that the plasma frequency is approximately nine times the square root of the electron density. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Anything else? All right, so anyway, the reason I'm doing this is we would like to use the RBN to give us some way of estimating the FOF2, because if we could do that, we would have a way of getting at these numbers over a large area, even though we don't have ionosons everywhere we go. So this is something that Ethan Miller um, came up with. And um, it's pretty simple. It as I mentioned before, the maximum usable frequency is related to the, um, to the FOF2 parameter by some angle of, refract of um, refraction. And so if you have a transmitter here and you have a receiver there, um, if you can calculate this angle theta right there, um, and if you know the maximum usable frequency between these two links, then you know the FOF2 for that particular point. And so we can use the RBN data to estimate, make, a, make some sort of estimated measurement of, this num of these numbers. And the way we do that is we know the location of all the receivers in the, in the RBN uh, based on um, the reported call signs. 
and then they hear the transmitted call signs, and we can make an, a very educated guess as to where the transmitters are located by looking up in a QRZ where they're um, located. And then we can, we assume a height right now of, I believe, uh, 300 kilometers altitude, uh, which turns out to be a, a good guess. And then with all that information from the RBN, we can, oh, and, and for the maximum usable frequency, we look at all the RBN data and we say that the highest frequency that we see in a particular region, that we're going to call that the maximum usable frequency. And that will give us some sort of FOF2 value. And there's a lot of assumptions that go into that, but it actually works out fairly well. And so this is um, a map of the United States during a 15 minute period during the 2014 November sweepstakes. And um, you can see that there's a lot of reflection points. Each of these is a reflection point color coded by band, and they're binned by grid squares. And so for any particular grid square, uh, we can look at the highest frequency that's reflected within that grid square, and we can um, call that the maximum usable frequency. And then we can look at the angles between the stations that made that contact, and then we can make a map of um, this estimated RBN FOF2. And here, this, it turned out uh, very nicely, because here you can see darkness, you can see much lower values for FOF2, these uh, purples and blues, and then you can see how it transitions over the higher values, um, the greens and blue and lighter blues during the day. So you get this nice gradient across the dawn terminator. Um, so I was able to make a video of this. This is for how it changed for the entire weekend for um, how the FOF2 changed for the entire weekend. So you can see at night, you have some less. So during the day, the estimated FOF2 is higher. You can also see these little um, triangles here. Those are the RBN receivers. So you can see the East Coast is rather dense with RBN receivers. We need more RBN receivers throughout the rest of the US and throughout the rest of the world. We get daylight again, higher values, night lower values coming. So this is. And for any 15 minute period, we're seeing somewhere around 400 reflection points on this map. So that's, that's pretty good. And this is again during CQ, uh, I'm sorry, November sweepstakes in 2014. So one other thing we can do is we can look at a particular grid square that also has an ionosonde in it. So this is Wallops Island, Virginia. And we can compare the ionosonde data uh, with the RBN estimate. And that's what we have here. So the green line is the ionosan, and the blue line is the RBN data. And you can see they're in fairly good agreement. Yeah. Yeah. We've got, um, there's, it's not perfect, but the general trend is there. And so this at least shows that, you know, over, over this particular region, that we're seeing the right, the right trends. So of course, where you have, if you have an ionos on there, that's going to be much better data, much higher quality data than the ham radio data. But for places where maybe you don't have an ionos on, say um, other parts of the US, or what about like the Atlantic Ocean, we don't have ionos on out there, we might be able to use the ham radio data to complement other space physics data and help us figure out things that maybe we couldn't have figured out before because we didn't have data there, we didn't have pools. So um, that's one neat thing about this RBN FOF2. Um, I want to point out that um, the RBN is not the only network in town. So we've talked a lot about that, but of course there's also WhisperNet, the weak signal propagation reporting network. They have a lot of data as well. And also PSK Reporter. Um, PSK Reporter includes not only PSK, but also RIDI. Um, it will include the different JT modes, like um, uh, let's see, JT65 and JT9 and things like that. And these, all of these databases have a large amount of spots. So the RBN started in 2009 and there's over 578 million spots, uh, about 36 gigs of data. 
Um, WhisperNet started in 2008, 535 million spots. And PSK Reporter started in 2013, there's over a billion spots. And so this is a lot of data. And there's even some other ham radio sources as well. And now I talked about, the, um, about this RBN FOF2 method, but I should say that you know, we are, that's just one approach for looking at this data. Right now, uh, we, our team here, we're trying to come up with all sorts of different and new ways to look at this data and to pull information out of this. So it's a big data problem. It's, um, it's, it's really challenging and interesting. So if you have any ideas on how to look at that, you can let us know. So, for the final part of the talk, I want to talk about the, uh, the eclipse, which is coming up. So, how many people here are going to see the eclipse? Anyone? We've got a couple of people. So, did you know that you can see the eclipse from New Jersey? Anywhere. Anywhere. Anywhere in New Jersey. Anywhere. Anywhere in New Jersey, yeah. In your backyard. In your backyard, yes. <coughs> so now how many people are going to see the eclipse? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. So yeah, so even if you're here in New Jersey. Full eclipse? No. Partial. You get a partial eclipse. Partial. Okay. That's the difference. Um, so if you're here in New Jersey, you will only see a partial eclipse. I believe it's around 80% or so. But it's still I mean it's still significant. You know? So if you don't have plans to go see totality, it's okay. You can still see it here in New Jersey. All right? Which is really cool. Um, so this is going to take place on August 21st, 2017. And it's going to start, totality is going to start in Oregon um, around uh, at 1716 UT. And in, within 90 minutes, the shadow of, this, of the moon is going to traverse across the United States and leave South Carolina at 1851 um, UT. What does that translate in our time? Um, so you can just subtract four hours from these numbers. So this is going to be um, 1451, so about 2 p.m., 3 p.m. or so. 3 p.m. local, 3 p.m. local time. It will be exiting here. So, so that's the eclipse, and this is a huge deal because um, there. These things happen very rarely, and they very rarely happen over such um, highly, um, highly populated areas. Yeah. There has not been, I don't think there's been a total solar eclipse in the, United, in the continental United States as long as I've been alive. Okay, so we get this one, and then we'll, we will get another one actually in 2024 going this way. And then after that, I don't think I'll see another one in my lifetime in the United States. <laughs> so, what's that? You're not that old. I know, but that's that's how far apart these eclipses are. <laughs> They're that rare. Why is it only across the United States right now, and not other parts of the world? Um, just because of the geometry of the sun and the moon and oh, here. Okay. Yeah. So you'd have to look at the geometry. If um, for questions about like why is a shadow in this particular place and stuff like that. There are, there are a lot of really good websites that will show you the geometry of how these things line up and explain why, why the eclipse happens here and there and, and not other places. So, um, But what I, one of the things I know about is that not only do the eclipses have stunning visual effects, but they're also going to affect the ionosphere. Mm -hmm. And so this has been actually studied for about 50 years or so, more than 50 years, these uh, eclipses We've known that eclipses affect the atmosphere. But there's still a lot of open questions. Um, this is some data from an eclipse on August 11, 1999, that happened in the United Kingdom. And um, so the green line here is observed FOF2 by an ionosan. And the smooth blue line here is a plot of what the IRI, the International Reference Science Group, predicts. And the eclipse happens in this region here. And what you can see is that the IRI is predicting what would happen if you didn't have an eclipse. The green line shows what really happened. And so you can see that um, between, say, 8 local time and noon, there is a significant departure. The FOF2 is lower um, than what was predicted. And so basically, these eclipses, what happens is it's like um, things get dark slowly, so it's going to be like a very, uh, very slow dusk, and then all of a sudden things will drop very quickly to like to almost total darkness, and then they'll come back up 
rather quickly, but not all the way, and then it'll be like a very gradual dawn. So, um, in some ways, it's like putting night on the ionosphere, but the, the what's that? I had another question. Okay, but the time, the times in which that happens are different compared to day and night. The speed at which darkness comes and goes is very different, and so that gives you very different ionospheric dynamics than you would just for normal um, dusk and dawn. Yes. Now to look at this directly. Yes. What is recommended for eyewear? So there you can get special um, eclipse glasses, mm -hmm. which are really rather inexpensive. Number two welding glasses, which are made of, I believe, yeah. mylar. They're actually, well, they're, they have a, it's like a mylar-like substance, but the ones that they sell, which are just a couple dollars, they're actually, you know, supposed to be like specifically tested for this. Like they recommend not using traditional mylar, but, um, I know if you if you go online right now, you can order some of these Eclipse glasses. Um, they look a lot like the 3D glasses that you might get, the cardboard ones, but instead of having like red and blue lenses or um, polarizing lenses, it'll just be like very dark, very, very dark lenses. And they'll say that they're certified on um, So you, you can go find those online. Yes. Can I comment? I've seen them in Lowe's over the weekend. Oh, yeah? Like, like five, six dollars a piece with the cardboard ones. And uh, Micro Center has had mm -hmm. Patterson off and on. So mm -hmm. oh, okay. around. And yeah. These are some of Amazon. Amazon, there you go. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're quite popular. And then this over here, this is a, another <coughs> model of what the ionosphere looks like at 280 kilometers altitude during this eclipse. And um, this is, you can see this ionospheric density depletion here. This is Europe. Um, there's uh, Norway and uh, Sweden up there. That's um, you know, the center of Europe right there. So you can see this is a rather large effect that you can see. Um, another thing you can get are these things called uh, Doppler shifts, um, which, I, which we heard, you know, a Doppler shift in, uh, from the aurora. But you can also measure some Doppler shifts in the um, over HF ray paths as a result of the eclipse as well. And that's what's seen here from um, this, this is a Russian paper, I believe, from 1999. And this is from a Russian eclipse that happened in 1997. And here they're making Doppler shift measurements over a period of three days. So this is the day before the eclipse, this is the day of the eclipse, and this is the day after the eclipse. And here you can see a, a large departure. So this is um, basically change in frequency um, in a uh, going from 0 hertz in the middle to 0.4 hertz up there, 0.4 hertz, negative 0.4 hertz down there. Again, 0 in the middle here, negative 0.4 hertz, positive 0.4 hertz. So there's, a, there's normally quite a bit of variation in the signal path. But when the eclipse came by, you had a very large, a rather large change in the Doppler shift. So you're able to see the, how much um, the eclipse could affect the propagation path. And so, um, one of the things I'm here to talk to you about tonight is how can ham radio operators help to study what's going on in the eclipse. And uh, I'm going to talk about two methods tonight. And the first one is a little bit more scientific and a little bit more controlled. Have any, has anyone here participated in the frequency measurement tests? No? So, what's that? Has anyone heard of the frequency measurement tests? Okay. So, twice a year. Um, the ALRL sponsors these frequency measurement tests, and certain ham radio operators enjoy making very high frequency, very high precision frequency timing and measurements. So even these nice fancy radios that you buy right off the shelf um, that have these digital displays, you think they're pretty stable in terms of frequency, and they are. But they're really not super stable, so they, they can drift like very little bit each way. There are some ham radio operators that um, get special oscillators that are either disciplined by GPS signals, they're called GPS disciplined oscillators, or maybe they have cesium or rubidium standards in there, and they can actually improve the sensitivity, or the, I'm sorry, not the sensitivity, they can improve the stability of their radio receiver. And they can use this along with um, special software techniques to achieve measurement accuracies of better than 0.001 hertz. Wow. Yeah. And so these guys, they're actually capable of measuring HF path Doppler shift. 
So they're going to be able to go out during the eclipse, turn on their receive equipment and their processing stuff, and we're going to have them listen to, say, uh, WWV or the Canadian equivalent CHU during the eclipse, and, you, and they're going to look to measure these Doppler shifts. Okay. And so this is, um, this is from November of 2016, the frequency <coughs> measurement test. These are the people that um, were making measurements of this transmitter station in Ohio, WRKO, and they submitted um, reports. So you can see that the frequency measurement community is pretty well spread out. There's a bunch in uh, California and um, over here in the West Coast. There's a bunch of people in the center, central US. And there's a bunch of people on the East Coast. And then kind of these other places, it's a little bit empty. Um, but you can see there's, there's about 100 stations that participate in making these measurements. And what's interesting from the ionospheric perspective is normally what they do in the frequency measurement test is the transmitting station, <coughs> W8RKO, they'll say, we're going to transmit on approximately this frequency, but not exactly. And you have to tell us exactly where we're transmitting. And usually the ionosphere is a big problem for these guys because it's, you saw how much variation it's causing, right? And so these guys try to normally remove the effects that the ionosphere is putting on the signal to get the actual transmit frequency. Here, that's actually not what they're trying to do. What they actually want to do is they want to um, measure um, what the ionosphere is doing. So they're going to know exactly what frequency is being transmitted and we want to see those variations in their measurements because that tells us what the ionosphere is doing. So um, for this experiment, we're going to look for Doppler shifts in uh, the WWB and the CHU uh, signals. Um, the ham radio receivers are spread across the US. Uh, I also have a friend, Gareth Perry, from um, uh, he's up at Calgary, University of Calgary right now. He has a satellite that's going to listen um, from above to these stations. And we're going to ask these people to make two measurements, one on the control day of August 20th, and then one on the eclipse day. And um, we might add a, a third one the day after, so we do something like the Russian paper did, where you have three days. And um, these plans are tentative, but if you go to hamsite.org and you click the Get Involved section for the eclipse, um, you'll be able to find this page here where we are you know, working on coming up with the final protocol for what we want these, this community to do. So, and then here are, here's where the beacon stations are. So, uh, CHU transmits on 3.330 megahertz, 7 megahertz, and 14 megahertz, and that's up in Canada. And WWE and Fort Collins, which most of you are probably familiar with, transmits on 3.5, 5, 10, 15, and 20 megahertz, and that's over there. And we're going to ask that stations that are located, say, north of the eclipse path listen to WWV, and stations south of the eclipse path listen to CHU, and that way we get um, yeah, things going across the eclipse. I guess it would be nice if we could move WWV a little bit farther south. Maybe we can talk to them about Probably that. Probably easier to move the eclipse. Yeah, it might be easier to move the eclipse. Why not use commercial AM broadcast stations use their steady state signals and they're all over the U.S. and Canada. We actually, there's another experiment doing that as well. So, um, I, uh, Sky and Telescope magazine, one of their contributing authors, Joe Breo, who's actually a, a weatherman around here as well, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's asking um, people to submit their reception reports of AM broadcast signals to yeah. him. And if you go to hamside.org, you'll find a link to his project as well. So if he's, you're into uh, doing that. I think he's with New Jersey 12. Yeah, I, I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so that's actually really good. So if you have friends that you want them to be a part, they're interested in doing radio stuff, but maybe they're not a ham radio operator, or maybe they don't have all this fancy equipment, or maybe they're not into contesting, um, you know, that's a good way for them to get involved. They can just use a simple, you know, off-the-shelf AM receiver, and you can read Joe Rayo's article, which you can get a link to from my website, and you will be able to send those reports in him, and then he'll compile all of that and let you know what everyone hears. So that was a great, great point about the AM stations. Um, here, one of the reasons we're using these is because um, these standard stations actually have an even higher stability than your typical AM broadcast station, and they are on the HF bands as opposed to the MF bands. So 
Uh, different people are looking at the eclipse from different perspectives. I'm an HF person, so that's where my interest lies, and so I put a lot of focus on there. Other people, like Bill Lyles, and there's, you might have heard of the Eclipse Mob Project, they're looking at VLF signals, so we have a link to them on our website as well. Um, Joe Rayo, he's doing the AM stuff, that's medium frequency. I'm doing more um, high frequency. And then there's a lot of guys out there who are doing like um, nanometer wavelength stuff, I think the optical guys. It's a, a bunch of people who are uh, looking at the eclipse visually. So it just depends where your emphasis is. So this is um, the other thing that we are looking at doing, and this is the solar eclipse QSO party. And so the idea behind this is that we would like to flood the airways with HF signals. And by generating a lot of QSOs, we should be able to image the ionospheric changes. And so this goes back to the idea I was showing you before that you know, during a contest, you get a lot of signals on the air. And then by doing that, you have a chance of seeing where maybe the, how far north the eclipse effects on the atmosphere go, how far south they go, how long they last from place to place. So we just get a lot of signals on the air, then we can look at data from RBN, PSK Reporter, etc. Participant submitted logs, and we can get an idea of that. Um, so the Solar Eclipse QSO party is going to be um, an eight hour event from 1400 to 2200 UT on August 21st, and it's going to be contest like. So one of the things we're trying to do here is just generate a lot of QSOs. Um, we've given two points to CW or digital stations because those stations are the ones that are able to be observed by the RBN, PSK reporter, etc. Phone contacts are still, they're worth one point and they're still valuable because you can submit our, your logs to us and um, we can use the data from your logs to help study the answer. And uh, we have multipliers as well, so uh, we, we multiply your score by the number of grid squares you work. And the idea is that we try and get you to talk to many different people. Um, the exchange is your uh, signal report plus your six character grid square. And I talked about all the data sources. And um, we have the rules posted on hamsci.org. Yes? The signal report should be realistic, not like a regular conference. Yes, it's true. We do encourage real signal reports. but. I'll tell you, I'm not entirely worried about that. And the reason is because I'm going to be getting a lot of computer measured signal reports from the data sources over here, from the WhisperNet, from RBN, from PSK reports. So they're going to be like doing these computer measured signal reports. But yes, please try to give us real signal reports as opposed to just 599 for everything. And if you're using digital, you might actually put in the um, um, you put in the, the dB value that's measured. So when you go home tonight, you can go look at the rules on hamsci.org slash seqp. I can tell you right now, I'm working on modifying the rules a little bit right now to um, include better guidance for people who want to operate things like JT65 and JT9, because that really isn't in the rules right now, but we're, gonna, we're putting that in now so people can do that. There's also going to be better guidance on how to do the logging, how to handle those signal reports. Um, so there's going to be a, a little modification to that. Yes? I got word the other day that N1MM has created a special contact contest for That's absolutely correct. We are working with N1MM, and um, N1MM does support the Solar Eclipse QSO party under contest log type Eclipse. Um, I should also note that I found out just today that there's a little bug in that. Um, so right now when you generate your Cabrillo file with the Eclipse module, you don't get your signal reports in the final log. Okay, but, but someone very kindly wrote to me today and they, they um, looked at the sample log or post and they pointed that out. So um, the developer said he is going to go in and, and fix that. And so um, pro he said the next public release of N1MM Plus, which is probably either tomorrow or sometime this week, will have the bug, will have that fixed. So um, maybe wait till the end of the week to download that and, and maybe do a few test QSOs, make sure when you generate your Cabrillo file, the signal reports are in there. So that will be, that will be there, but we're very glad to have N1MM supporting us like that. Um, and the person who's coding that 
for us is Nick N A three M, I think. You may have to double check that. I, I gave him credit on the website. I believe. Um, so we have some bonus points. So you can you get an extra hundred points if you operate during totality. Now here in New Jersey, you're not in totality. So how do you get your bonus points? We're going to define that as the point of time where it is closest to. Um, uh, where you have maximum shadow. So the point in time where you have maximum shadow for your particular area, that will count as totality for you. you we also have it so you can operate outdoors so you can see the eclipse, you get 100 bonus points for that, so you can go field day style. Um, operate at a public venue, you get another 100 points. Provide us extra station information, you get 50 points for that, for each of those things you provide. Um, let's see, if you operate uh, one of these RBN, PSK reporter, WhisperNet nodes during the contest, like over there. Um, then you get um, extra points for that. And you also get points for being spotted by these different networks. So every time you call CQ, even if no one's coming back to you, you can get a point for being spotted. And those will be awarded after the fact. Um, and here we go. N1MM Plus now has native support for the Solar Eclipse QSO party. It's under log type E. Clips. Um, if you don't like N1MM Plus, you can use any software that supports the AWRL VHF contest exchange format. And uh, you can follow the instructions at our website for how to upload the logs. We're still working on our log uploader. Um, we do have, well, have downloadable participation certificates available. Those have been designed, which is nice. And um, final scores and bonuses will be posted on hamsci.org at a later date. Um, so this is our website, so again the ham side is a ham radio science citizen investigation and our goals are to advance scientific uh, research and understanding through amateur radio activities, uh, encourage the development of the new technologies to support this research, and to provide educational opportunities for the amateur community and the general public. Um, we are partnering with the AWRL, they're providing a lot of our uh, PR right now. So they provided us this booth space at the Dayton Hamvention this year. And um, so uh, you can see, um, let's see. You see Josh and Josh. Yeah, you can see Josh. Well, there's me. There's uh, Josh number two, and there's Josh number one. And there's Ward Silver, and there's many other team members from our group. So I was very happy that the AWRL was able to provide that to us. And um, they also gave us a forum space where we were able to do oral talks. So if you go to hamside.org slash Dayton 2017, you can watch videos of all of those talks. Um, and all of you uh, know what the AWRL is. And we are on the cover of QST this month, which is very nice. <laughs>